This is an extraordinary episode uh, in the history of the Royal Navy, and I suppose is one of those examples of how the British uh, are quite successful in turning a catastrophic uh, defeat and humiliation into a national triumph. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. The events of 1949 in China reverberated across the world and throughout the rest of the century. That tumultuous year saw the dramatic collapse of Chiang Kai-shek's pro-Western nationalist government overthrown by Mao Zedong and his communist armies and the foundation of the People's Republic of China. I talked with author Graham Hutchings who has written a vivid gripping account of China in 1949. We discussed the politics, the military campaigns and the legendary amethyst incident where a British warship became embroiled in the Chinese Civil War. We also have a book giveaway of Graham's book, China 1949, so make sure you check out the links in the show notes. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can show your support via a monthly donation of $4, £3 or €3 Euros via Patreon. Plus, you get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you. But don't take my word for it. Here's one of our Patreons. Hi, uh, my name's Glenn and I'm from New Zealand. I've always been fascinated by the Cold War. This podcast just brings it all back to life and Ian does such a good job of this. And that's just why I support him on the Patreon. If you'd like to help support the podcast, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us as well as sharing us on social media. So, back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Graham Hutchings to our Cold War conversation. The Chinese Civil War is usually thought to range from 1946, about the middle of that year, to 1949. But in fact, that is a period of intense fighting and competition, of battlefield struggle, of indeed bloodshed and sorrow, as well as triumph for the revolutionary forces. We need to understand that that period of close encounter, close contest, had its origins in the 1920s, when Partly inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the Chinese intellectuals uh, signed up, as it were, for Marxism and the techniques that the Bolsheviks had used to seize power, whereas others uh, felt that there was much to be had from a process of reform, gradualism, of developing the country slowly and in stages. These two courses if you like, one represented by the Chinese Communist Party, one represented by the Nationalist Party, or KMT, or Guomindang, led by Chiang Kai-shek, came together briefly in the mid-1920s to try and make China modern, make China strong, make China uh, prosperous, but fell out big time. And they uh, had a bloody and sanguinary exchange in the late 1920s and were then on fighting each other for the soul of China. This goes back some time, and then you've got Japanese involvement as well in the 1930s. This matters enormously. China was essentially at war almost from the moment the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, collapsed in 1911. Uh, There were warlord wars, there was the problem of foreign threats, and the most serious of those was realized in July 1937 when the Japanese began their forward policy. Remember, had, they had by this time already taken Manchuria and were sitting in and on the industrial heartland of China, such as it was, not to be dismissed. It was um, a very rich area. And they decided to move into China proper 
1937. And so between 1937 and 1945, long before the war started in Europe, in other words, the Chinese people were at war with Japan and subject to a great deal of brutality and oppression. This was uh, another period when uh, the Kuomintang, the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists under Mao Zedong, supposed to have worked together to fight the common enemy, uh, both fought, uh, but the burden of battle fell upon Chiang Kai-shek nationalists, and the Japanese occupied large chunks of the country, all the important seaports, all the key economic areas, and subjected the Chinese people to the protracted horrors of war. So you could certainly argue that China was the first victim of World War II rather than the Eurocentric view that Poland was the first victim of World War II. Absolutely. China only joined World War II in the accepted sense of that term in 1941 when the Japanese attacked uh, first Pearl Harbor and then Hong Kong, bringing both America and Britain into a conflict against Tokyo, but the Chinese people had been enduring Japanese depredations since the late 1930s, 1937 to be precise, in China proper, and the early 1930s in the case of the Chinese territory of Manchuria. What what were the backgrounds of Mao and Chiang Kai-shek? They were different, but they had some similarities. What was similar uh, about them? What did they have in common? Uh, They were men of great resourcefulness and determination, men who were obstinate uh, in temperament and extremely resilient in the face of setbacks and hardships. Where they differed was in their vision for the future of their country. They were equally devoted to the cause of their country, but went around serving it in very different ways. Jiang was from a poor family uh, in the, however, a prosperous southeastern part uh, of China, and he had been educated in Japan, he'd been educated in the Soviet Union, didn't think much of the latter at all, and was convinced that a Soviet future was inimical to the best interest of the Chinese nation and the Chinese people. Mao Zedong, on the other hand, born in Hunan, also South China, but further west, the offspring of a rich peasant family, had been convinced by Marxism and its message, had been convinced by the Bolshevik Revolution and the global message that that seemed to hold, especially for those oppressed nations, oppressed by foreigners, oppressed by internal reactionary forces, as Mao Zedong thought China certainly was. That was his inspiration And these two men, their iron personalities, their strong will and their different creeds were such uh, that they were pitted against each other for this long period, beginning in the late 1920s, right up to the end of 1949, when Mao achieved a nearly complete victory. And you could say right up to the end of their lives in Chiang Kai-shek's case, 1975, in Mao Zedong's the year after, 1976. Right, and we'll come on to sort of like their legacy continuing into the uh, the later part of the Cold War later on in this, in this conversation. By 1949, what were the scale of the, the battles in this conflict? Well, we often associate the victory of communism in China with um, guerrilla tactics, with rural insurrection, with the reworking of the countryside, with land reform, um, and rather neglect what was truly decisive, certainly in the period between 1947 and 1949. What we neglect there is the fact that the Civil War was a question not of insurgency, but of pitched battles by mass troops, often involving artillery, sometimes involving tanks. The nationalist side, Jiang's side, had an air force and had a navy, uh, which it did not successfully deploy, though it was used. But what we're seeing here are battles on the scale that easily 
uh, match those fought in the European war in the 1940s. Um, and uh, this is a neglected uh, element, and it reminds us of something which is not always touched upon, neither indeed entirely acceptable to the communist government to this day, which is that we're talking about a change of government. We're talking about a revolution, but one secured on the battlefield, not by popular demand, not by rural insurrection, but by the mass deployment and mobilisation of armies. So by 1949, Mao's now threatening the industrial heartland of of China. In fact, he, he captures Beijing. How does the nationalists react to uh, the situation? By the start of 1949, the nationalists are in a very, very serious situation. Manchuria has gone. North China, defined as that huge part of the country north of the Yangtze, is very close to falling into Mao's hands. And as you rightly say, Beijing and its port, Tianjin, are also all but in Mao's grasp. It's just a question of a matter of of days. So Chiang Kai-shek says to himself, can we hold on in South China? Can we hold on by talking peace with the communists? Can we play for time in such a way that we can reorganize our own defenses in the South, get our house in order? Uh, Perhaps we can even get the Americans to come in. They had not been supportive of Jiang for at least the previous year, seeing their assets, his assets, uh, be defeated at almost every turn by the communists and decided they simply couldn't back him anymore. But when the Americans realized, Jiang Kai-shek said to himself and his advisors, that the whole of China was in danger of being lost to communism, surely uh, they would change their minds, open the spigot, and turn on military aid, and perhaps even send troops in the ideal situation and rescue China from its red fate. So a great time of anxiety, uh, of panic, um, uh, of, of, of hoping to hang on. And Chiang Kai-shek said, well, this is the last thing I want to do, but I'm willing, willing to give up the presidency uh, hand over to the vice president, a man called Li Zongren, and allow him to open peace talks with the communists precisely to realise this game plan of playing for time. And was Zhang trying to be quite shrewd here in terms of passing this to somebody else to uh, handle and uh, him still retaining his status? He was extremely wily. Uh, He had been, by the start of 1949, the man most blamed, and rightly so, for the strategic setbacks and disasters. He wasn't a very compelling or successful military leader. Uh, Nothing succeeds like success, nothing is so damaging as defeat, and that was the situation that he faced. He had no intention of giving up power permanently, and he had really little intention of giving it up uh, for very long at all. But it would be a good time to facilitate peace talks with the communists, to step down, to retreat from public life for a while, and importantly, to stay close enough to the scene of things so that he knew what was going on, and more important still, to think about where, should it come to it, he should make his last stand. Where should be his bastion? Which part of the country would he concentrate his assets in and fight to the very end? So those were on his, uh, those are the thoughts on his mind uh, as the year 1949 opens. So it's at this point he's looking at the island of Taiwan as a possible last bastion. He is looking at Taiwan, uh, but he's not committed to Taiwan irrevocably. He thinks South China holds some possibilities. It might be uh, in the Canton region, now known as Guangzhou, not so very far from Hong Kong in the south. It might be in the fastnesses of South China, Southwest China. Remember that during the war against Japan, about which we've spoken, that long, bitter conflict, the nationalist capital was in Chongqing, Chongqing as it's pronounced uh, correctly. 
up way up the Yangtze, and Jiang thought he might be able to hold on there as well. So he had a number of options, and I think it's important to bear that in mind and not um, imagine that he's irrevocably committed to Taiwan, though that island does have many advantages. How far away is it from the mainland of China? 100 miles would be a little bit of a, um, a an exaggeration, but not too much. You've got a substantial stretch of water. You've got a territory which had only recently been reincorporated into China proper with the defeat of Japan at the end of the Second World War in 1945. And you had uh, what mattered to Jiang quite a lot, an island where communism had made next to no inroads and uh, therefore the place would form a solid platform There'd be social stability there, and to some extent, an infrastructure that the Japanese had left behind, which would form a very good base for resistance against the imagined communist attack, and possibly even as a springboard for staging a recovery. Were they still hanging on to, presumably, the Central Bank of China's gold and cultural artefacts? Well, this is one of the things that Jiang does. Uh, he steps down and he's giving immediately a great deal of thought to shipping to the island those resources that are needed to sustain the fight and importantly to uh, enable him to claim some legitimacy. Let me explain what I mean by that. On the former, uh, the munitions, the army, um, uh, naval vessels, aircraft, shipping those to Taiwan speaks for itself. He sought to concentrate resources incidentally taking them away from his nominal successor acting president, Li Zongren, and moving them uh, to Taiwan where they would remain under his firm control. But guns and bullets, men in uniforms, aeroplanes, the weapons of war, they account for only part of what it is to be the legitimate ruler. He needed also to remind the Chinese people, indeed the wider world, that his government was the custodian of China's great achievements as a civilization. So the treasures, the cultural artifacts, the paintings, the scrolls, all those things that had previously been in museums and in vaults on the mainland, He Jiang makes sure gets shipped to Taiwan in precarious uh, voyages uh, very often, and he is able to position himself as the man protecting China's cultural achievements from uh, communist destruction. Hong Kong was still under British rule at this point. What, what was the position of, of Hong Kong and how did the British authorities feel about Mao? The British spent 1949, indeed part of 1948, increasingly worried about the outcome of the Civil War. Remember that the British, unlike the Americans, for all that we've said, the Americans were not at all keen on Chiang Kai-shek. They felt that he was not strong enough to win the war, uh, that he was not legitimate and popular enough to be worth supporting, but they also felt he was too weak to abandon. I beg your pardon, he was too important to abandon. What I mean by that is the Americans had a very strong interest in not seeing China go red. As far as the British were concerned, their view was slightly different. They were not willing to take sides in the Chinese Civil War in any respect. They had no love for Jiang and certainly no love for Mao. What they did have, even more than the Americans, was a very considerable financial stake in Chinese cities, notably, though not only, Shanghai, where they had millions of pounds of investment. They had many nationals in various Chinese cities, Shanghai again being to the fore, and they had a piece of Chinese territory, Hong Kong, which they had been in possession of in part since 1840. They gained another part in 1860 and 1898. They got the lease on the new territory. So these three constituent parts constituted the British part of China. And in London and in Hong Kong, the great anxiety was how far south would the communists come? They knew the communists were nationalist as well as communist and were very keen to recover all the lost territories. Perhaps Mao would sweep south so quickly 
and uh, so consistently that he would pay no attention to the frontier and kick the British out of Hong Kong. It was therefore for them a rather anxious period. I I can imagine. So by March, the communist armies reached the the Yangtze River. How well defended was the river by the nationalists? On paper, it looked pretty good. There were substantial forces ranged just along the North Shore, but in depth on the South Shore from the environs of Shanghai in the east uh, right up to Wuhan in the central part of the river, indeed the central part of China. The communist crossing was well planned, well organized, and it required a great deal of logistical acumen and genius, one might say, to get so many hundreds of thousands of troops. Remember that in part the Yangtze is uh, uh, more than a mile wide, uh, that uh, it races very fast, uh, that uh, crossing it is very precarious, and that the soldiers of the People's Liberation Army, the Communist Army, had no experience in amphibious warfare, which they thought they might well have to fight, and moreover were, for the most part, northern Chinese, used to the culture, the lifestyle, the cuisine, the languages of North China, and they were now being thrust into a very different world of South China, or they would uh, when they made the crossing. So what we see as a result of this preparation and organizational skill on the part of communists is the amassing of an armada of small boats and uh, the conscripting uh, or the forced volunteering might be more accurate of, uh, <laughs> of sailors and captains to get the flotilla across. They might have been, if not stopped, at least frustrated, at least thwarted, uh, at least delayed in their crossing had the nationalist defence been well organised. But it fell victim to this rivalry between Chiang Kai-shek, supposedly retired, supposedly behind the scenes, and Li Zongren, and Li Zongren's military colleague Bai chong Shi in the middle of the Yangtze. Uh, these were men, Li and Bai, from Guangxi in the southwest of China, not that far from Hong Kong, but a bit inland, uh, where there had been a very powerful tradition of quasi-independence, uh, a, a powerful uh, military tradition uh, of ability proved itself during the war against Japan. These men were men of considerable skill and prestige, but as a result of the discord in nationalist ranks of divisions between themselves and Chiang Kai-shek, the defence collapsed. Uh, it collapsed on almost the entire length, 400 to 500 mile front, and the communists were over in a matter of 48 hours. They'd shipped several tens of thousands of people, and in a week had got over a million men across the river and into the cities where the nationalist government had traditionally drawn on for most of its support. Yeah, that's qu quite a feat. And those numbers really do show how vast this conflict was. And it beggars belief, some of these numbers. And I found it really interesting because I'm quite familiar with World War II. And these are at least on that scale, if not larger numbers in, involved in this conflict. That's right. You, 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 you're right to say that. Uh, it's, perhaps the clue to this is to think or remind oneself that China is a continental-sized country, and this war, though it left parts of the country, indeed quite large parts, untouched, it nonetheless raged over huge expanses and ranges and touched the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Now, with the, with the communists across the Yangtze, they're sh threatening Shanghai, which was one of the most major cities in China. But it's an interesting city because it has a very international makeup due to history, really. Absolutely. It was the, you might say, most globalised city in China, to use language more familiar uh, in the present day than in the 1940s. It was internationally connected 
uh, to all the major trading, commercial, financial centers of the world, uh, profound connections between itself and the Chinese hinterland, the Chinese interior, it was the conduit through which trade, uh, ideas, uh, financial assets uh, passed. And in the context of the wider struggle taking shape at this time between the Soviet camp and the American uh, and British-led camp, it was the citadel of capitalism in Asia, even more than Tokyo. Remember that Tokyo at this time is still a capital of a defeated country, uh, one indeed um, still experiencing U.S. occupation. So the fall of Shanghai is hugely important symbolically, hugely important substantially. Both sides realize that, uh, both sides being the nationalist under Jiang, the communist under Mao, but the wider world realizes too that with the fall to communism of Shanghai in May 1949, something of the lights have gone out in Asia as far as the great capitalist citadels uh, are concerned. Because of the the international flavour of Shanghai, there's uh, British naval ships on the Yangtze, and there's an incident with a, a British frigate called HMS Amethyst. Can you just give us a bit more detail on that? This is an extraordinary episode uh, in the history of the Royal Navy, and I suppose is one of those examples of how the British are quite successful in turning a catastrophic uh, defeat and humiliation into a national triumph. Let me just expand that uh, point a little. HMS Amethyst was a frigate uh, moving up to the capital, uh, Nanjing, Jiang's capital, the capital of the Republic of China, uh, to stand uh, on guard duty uh, in the river Yangtze and ready to lift uh, British nationals, British embassy staff, and other third country nationals off should uh, that be necessary. Now, for reasons that are not easy to understand other than carelessness or incompetence, perhaps a mixture of both, HMS Amethyst was making its journey upriver at the precise moment that the communists were preparing their crossing. And the accounts differ, uh, but Amethyst was seen by the communist battery and was given a warning to vacate uh, the area. It declined to do so and was very badly damaged uh, in a subsequent outbreak of fire from the North Bank. Uh, a number of its personnel, uh, the ship's company, were killed and it was laid up uh, from the 20th, 20th of April until July, uh, hard against an island in the middle of the Yangtze when negotiations took place between the then victorious communists and the commander of uh, the Amethyst in an attempt to release the vessel, get it down to Shanghai and out into the ocean and eventually back home. These negotiations got nowhere. The privations of the crew were immense. Uh, other amongst the ship's company uh, lost their lives until in an, an episode of daring do, of the kind that the Royal Navy uh, likes, rather, uh, it escaped one night and got all the way downriver to Shanghai and out, eventually calling at Hong Kong and then to a uh, triumphant return um, in the... Um, and to, to England. But essentially, uh, this was a humiliation for the British. It signalled that their era uh, in sailing up the Yangtze without fear or anxiety was over, and that the Chinese, in this case, the Chinese communists, were firmly in charge of their own waterways. As, as you said before, once the communists across the Yangtze, many cities fall. And the acting president, Li Zonggren, he's part of the Jiangxi clique with somebody called Bai Xiongzi, I think. Now, the, the Jiangxi clique is interesting because they, they are from the Jiangxi province, which is where the Nationalist Army is retreating into. And that's a quasi-autonomous 
area of, of fiefdoms. And I think Chang is, is worried that this clique is going to try and negotiate a separate peace. Exactly so. And here one can sympathise with Chiang Kai-shek. Indeed, it would be a, a dull-souled pilgrim who had no sympathy for uh, someone in his uh, position. He's losing the war. The Americans have deserted him. And within his own ranks, he's got to watch his back. Uh, because these people from Guangxi have been uh, at odds with him over the future of China uh, for many, many years. And he has to worry uh, that in an effort to protect Guangxi's unofficial autonomous status, uh, Li and Bai might do a deal with the communists of the kind that would uh, leave a place for them in the new order. What eventually happened was that the Guangxi leaders realized that for all that they detested Chiang Kai-shek and blamed him for the collapse of the nationalist cause, only one thing was worse than that, and that was communism. And they found that when it came down to it, but only when it finally came down to it, they would have to side with the nationalist side rather than the communists, which is what they did. But the price of that was having their armies cut to ribbons in Guangxi in the autumn and early December of 1949. And without their armies, Li Zongren and Bai Chongxi counted for nothing. This is an era in which political power uh, derives almost exclusively from having powerful armies in the field. If you haven't got men with guns on your side, then you haven't got any political capital. And the careers of Li and Bai were sunk uh, when Lin Biao, perhaps the most talented of all Mao's rather talented generals, the man who in 1948, early 1949, had given them the victory in Manchuria up there in the northeast, uh, in the end of 1949, he cut Bai Chongxi's army to pieces. Li Zongren, already ill by this stage with the nationalist cause uh, rapidly uh, declining, uh, he left for the United States for medical treatment. Bai Chongxi hung on as long as he could, driven off the mainland to Hainan Island, only slightly smaller than Taiwan, an island fairly close to uh, Vietnam, down there in the southwest maritime corner of China. His career was finished thanks to Lin Biao's carving up of his armies, and he uh, flew to Taiwan to join Chiang Kai-shek and spent a rather unhappy rest of his life uh, under watch uh, by Chiang Kai-shek's spies. Mao, whilst he's having these incredible military victories, he's faced with a new challenge of managing cities because previously most of the territory that they'd um, taken over had been quite rural. Well, the communist revolution was born in the countryside, perfected in the countryside, and the countryside was the springboard for the conquest of the whole of China. That's uh, all fine and dandy, uh, but the kind of men who are good at fomenting rural revolution are not necessarily good at running modern cities as they were at the time, such as Beijing, Tianjin, and especially Shanghai and other uh, metropolitan centres along the Yangtze River. So Mao and his senior comrades spent many months uh, before 1949 talking to their carders, their party members, their party leaders about the need to switch, focus, to switch focus and to learn how to manage cities. This wouldn't be easy, and it wasn't indeed. What they had to do is they had to co-opt elites running the cities, saying, we're in charge now, we have a different goal, a different set of policies, but we need to work with you guys running industry, running the municipalities, and make sure that we can do a good job of it. Because if we're kicked out of the cities, if we're seen to fail there, then we'll be back in the countryside again, and we will, in effect, have lost the civil war. So it was a very big change. It's the change really from being insurrectionist to being the ruler, from being the rebel to being in charge. That's a big shift. And they had the added burden, uh, if that's the right word, stemming from the ideology uh, to which they adhered and fixed so firmly. That is to say that Marx 
uh, held that it would be the proletariat, uh, the working class, uh, the urban working class, moreover, who would lead the revolution, not the peasants. It would be the working class who would be more advanced ideologically, more enlightened, more progressive. They, the Chinese communists, had to reconcile the fact that contrary to what Marx had said, they began as rural insurrectionists and rebels and had to take over the city. So there were some big practical obstacles, some political obstacles, as well as some ideological considerations at work here. Yeah, and I, I found some fascinating detail in, the, in this section of the book about Mao abolished the legal code and for quite some years there was no proper legal code in China. Well, what we see in 1949, which is another reason why I was uh, keen to focus on this year, is the creation of those institutions and, as you point out, the destruction of those that existed uh, heretofore um, that really uh, unfolded a new system Uh, a political culture, indeed, in China, which persists to this very day. So in July, uh, Mao Zedong announced that the country would be run as a people's democratic dictatorship. This was the ruling principle set out in the foundation of the People's Republic of China, which Mao Zedong presided over with that big parade and procession in Tiananmen Square on the 1st of October. Uh, It would be a dictatorship where the people, defined by the party as those that supported it, uh, the peasants, uh, the workers, uh, some intellectuals, some indeed even uh, capitalists, would be in charge, uh, but the party would be the leading factor. Now, the previous disposition, the previous dispensation, its legal codes uh, would all have to be abolished so that Essentially, what you saw uh, emerge in 1949, and they existed for many decades thereafter, was people's courts, uh, where there wasn't so much a conventional prosecution and defence, but a summary judgment, and if you weren't careful, a summary execution of that judgment in the literal sense of that term. People's revolutionary justice was dispensed in the new order rather than the uh, slower processes of uh, legal codes that Chiang Kai-shek had set up. So by this time, I think the uh, communist armies have reached the border at Hong Kong. And the British are, of course, extremely alarmed by what happened uh, in April on the Yangtze. They saw Uh, that the Chinese communists had no hesitation about firing on foreign shipping. Uh, There had been casualties uh, among the crew, uh, deaths and injuries, as we uh, noted uh, a few moments ago. And so the British were concerned whether the Chinese would stop at the border. Why would they allow Hong Kong to remain? Well, We don't really have a convincing answer to that question of why, except we know, and the British drew some comfort from this, that the Chinese communists had an enormous amount of things on their plate in terms of running the place along the lines that they uh, wished to. They didn't want to entangle themselves in any further possible conflicts with the British, Moreover, they knew that Hong Kong was in some considerable difficulties. Remember that uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees, um, uh, civilians, most of them, but also some soldiers who cast off their uniforms at the border, had poured into the British colony and had choked it up, uh, presenting an enormous challenge for uh, the colonial government there in terms of providing housing and welfare for these groups. So, it was probably in Mao's mind that they didn't need to take over Hong Kong. The British might not be able to hang on to it very long anyway. If that was the case, uh, it is a supposition, then they misread the determination of uh, uh, Nguyen Bevan, uh, the foreign secretary, to retain Hong Kong and indeed the prime minister, Clem Attlee. The uh, British felt that they must be shown to be strong in the face of 
the communist onslaught in China, and they must do so in the light of a plain uh, advance of communism worldwide. Remember that they had uh, Malaya, now Malaysia, uh, to think about. They were then fighting the largely Chinese-led communist insurgents uh, in Malaya, and the British were determined to show that they were going to hang on to Hong Kong, and they were not going to signal that the, end, the, the, the age of empire had come to an end. So they moved into Hong Kong, a very substantial body of uh, troops, infantrymen, uh, fighter planes. They moved a carrier group uh, close by as well to say to the PLA, in effect, if you come in, we don't say we'll be able to stop you, but we're going to try and give you a hard time. And that probably also was another factor in the communist decision to stop uh, at the border and leave Hong Kong alone, which they did, of course, from 1949, when they arrived there, October time, right through until uh, July 1997, when as a process of uh, diplomatic negotiations, they recovered the territory of Hong Kong and the British left. And you have a great photo in the book of a British policeman and a a communist irregular staring at each other across a border marker. It's a really striking photo. I think, um, if I may say so, who shouldn't, uh, that photograph is probably worth the price of the book anyway. (sighs) There, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, just just talking about the book generally, this is a period of of history that I knew very little about the detail. You know, I knew I'd heard of Mao, I knew Chiang Kai Shek was, and had some idea, but it was really interesting to get into the detail here, but in a very digestible way. So this works for the general reader as well as somebody who's looking for 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 something more detailed as well. well. It's very good, very good of you to say that. I wanted with this book to achieve um, a, a number of goals. I wanted to set the geopolitical struggle uh, in some context to uh, explain the national tussle for control over the future of China, but above all, I think, to illustrate what this meant for ordinary Chinese people and non-Chinese people who perhaps had made their life and work uh, the case, uh, the question of China in one form or another. So that mixture of the ordinary, if I can use that term, man and woman, uh, as well as the political leaders and, of course, the behavior of the powers, uh, Truman in Washington, Stalin in Moscow, and uh, Attlee uh, in London. I wanted their perspective uh, to uh, to come into play as well. And I think that that works well. I I like the the eyewitness accounts. I mean that that's something that the the podcast is about is capturing those eyewitness accounts, and it does give you a different viewpoint away from that overall geopolitical strategic view that you know you you often get in 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 books i'm very glad to hear that well no i as you can tell i i did enjoy this one now in december mao goes to moscow why why is he going to meet with stalin this is a fantastic uh, uh, story he has essentially won the country though uh, the battle hasn't been wholly decisive in the southwest, though things have moved in a way in his favour that suggests there is no way out for Chiang Kai-shek. He's been trying to go to Moscow for a long time, but Stalin said to him over the previous 12 months, now I don't want you to visit yet, you're fighting a war, you've got a lot on your hands, you need to win the country first. What Stalin also had in mind was I think the fact that if Mao got to him too early, then the Americans would see uh, in a very uh, plain and obvious way uh, that these leaders were close to each other ideologically and that Stalin had a say, only a say, uh, in the direction of the Chinese revolution. So he wanted that kept under wraps a bit. But In December, Mao needs to go. He is a great admirer of Stalin. He's ready to accept him as the leader 
of the uh, socialist camp. He wants to express his fealty in person. No less important, he wants to secure Soviet backing for his new state, financial backing, aid, uh, technical advice, and uh, importantly, a security guarantee. Uh, Because he's not convinced uh, that Jiang, uh, with the Americans uh, in support, might not stage a comeback in some form or other. And if that should happen, if it should be necessary for Mao to beat Jiang twice, he will do that much more successfully if the Soviet Union is on his side. So he sets out for this journey. It's his first trip abroad. It's not a happy experience. Stalin at first receives him warmly, but then he leaves Mao to kick his heels in a dacha for several weeks, making no attempt to get any negotiations uh, going. Mao doesn't like the food, doesn't like the accommodation, wonders what's happening back home, wants to be treated seriously. Is finally treated seriously in terms of the alliance of 1950 uh, of mutual assistance and aid, uh, and then makes his way back. What we see in this period is the appearance of large numbers of Soviet advisors. Many of the Westerners, whether they be missionaries, diplomats, specialists of one kind or another, are beginning to leave. The new arrivals, the new foreign friends, are the Soviet advisors. A flood, we might use that word, I think, because there was a substantial number of Soviet advisors and technical experts who were coming to help the Chinese build bridges, construct railways, uh, uh, undertake political education, uh, build systems of scientific and inquiry and training of the kind that the new China of Mao Zedong needs so badly. He, Mao, is very keen that the country should be purged of Western or imperialist, as he would call it, influence, and that in future, the prevailing culture and mindset should be Soviet, should be socialist. China has switched camps. The most populous country in the world has left a loose orbit uh, around the Western world into a very firm, close association with the Soviet camp led by Joseph Stalin. The situation for the nationalist armies now is that they're facing complete defeat. 20,000 of them retreat into French Indochina. So there's this flight to Taiwan. How organized was that? Was it completely chaotic or was it quite an organized retreat into Taiwan? Parts of it were well organized. Jiang made sure he got his best armies across the straits and into Taiwan, but those that were not directly subjected to his command were, as it were, the fringe armies that had caused him so much trouble uh, in the nationalist camp. Their arrival was chaotic and disorganised. The same is true, of course, of the civilians who made it to the island. They too number in the hundreds of the thousands. What you see here is an exodus of China's talent, managerial talent, creative talent, administrative talent, educated people to Taiwan to escape uh, communism. And it looks uh, at the end of 1949 uh, as though Taiwan, chaotic and disordered, is going to fall to the communists once, uh, rather as they did in the Yangtze crossing, they've got all the amphibious kit that they need to make the even more substantial seaborne crossing to Taiwan and liberate the remaining piece of Chinese territory that is not yet under their control. The situation at the end of 1949, therefore, looks very dodgy. The Americans are still not going to rescue Chiang Kai-shek. They're rather thinking that, okay, we've lost the mainland in the sense that a communist in charge there, but perhaps Mao will be like Tito in Yugoslavia. Perhaps uh, we can imagine some tensions between Moscow and Beijing of the kind that eventually did emerge in the late 1950s and 1960s, but which in the 1940s, early 1950s might have made um, a path for American influence, albeit reduced, still to have some sway. Well, it didn't work out that way. It worked out in quite another way, because although we've said 
that Soviet advisors, among other things, made it possible for the new Chinese state to start building and reconstructing one of the very first things that the citizens of this new Chinese state had to do, paradoxically enough, was to fight yet again. Mao uh, ordered the so-called People's Volunteers to cross into North Korea when the American United Nation uh, troop advance had Uh, in his view, threatened China by moving north from Seoul and indeed from Pyongyang. When the Americans saw that the Chinese were willing to do that, then they at last woke up, or that's how Chiang Kai-shek would have seen it, and realized that they could not afford to let Taiwan fall to the communists. So they essentially moved the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Straits and uh, thwarted any attempt that Mao might have to get the PLA across to Taiwan. And that is the status quo to this very day. The island lives under an informal alliance with the United States that provides some protection, or at least it seems to, uh, because the long shadow of 1949 is such that the civil war is unfinished. Uh, In Beijing, we now have President Xi Jinping who is determined to solve the Taiwan problem as he views it in his mind and reunite all of China. That's one of the great legacy issues that statesmen today are dealing with, a legacy issue of 1949. Yeah, it's almost one of the last pieces of the Cold War that's that's remained unchanged apart from North and and South Korea. And even today, when we're recording in January 2021, in the news, there is Chinese aircraft uh, flying into Taiwan's airspace and Taiwan putting aircraft up. So even though this conflict was so long ago, it's still very much part of China and and. China's view today that Taiwan should be part of um, the communist orbit. Absolutely. There's no room for compromise on their part as far as this is concerned. I hesitate to say this because you often find when you say things of this nature that somebody is quickly able to, um, to point out your error. But I think this is the if it is one of if not the longest running unfinished civil wars and we are seeing signs now that that situation may change and that china is going as part of its general plan to increase its global footprint its standing its power its prestige to complete the unfinished story if you like of 1949 uh, that was a critical year. It was not a wholly decisive year. Uh, The wholly decisive year comes when communist China, if that's what it's going to do, communist rule China, takes over uh, Taiwan and this country is at last reunified. You've been listening to Graham Hutchins talking about his latest book, China, 1949, A Year of Revolution. I really enjoyed it. It was a great read and there was a lot I learned about a period of the early Cold War that I knew nothing about. We have organised a book giveaway with Bloomsbury, the publisher. So if you'd like to enter into that book giveaway, do make sure that you follow through to the show notes and details of those will be announced straight after this. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Mark Labance, Frederick Esposito, Jack Madwed, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. <laughs>
If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.